go back to um, 1993. Um, I was eight years old, and in school we were learning all about the terrible things that were going on in our environment and um, the future of our oceans. And simultaneously, um, a movie called Free Willy was um, released into the theaters, and this just created a sort of a sense of turmoil in my eight-year-old self. Um, so what did I do? Well, I wrote a letter to the then President of the United States, Bill Clinton, who then a few months later um, wrote me this personalized letter. Um, and he responded with, um, we cannot make these changes by ourselves. Uh, you can do your part by improving your community and striving to be an example to others. Signed, Bill Clinton. Um, and so this has been a thread throughout not only my life, but also my work. So now, Duolingo. Um, we're the largest language learning platform in the world. Um, and Duolingo was founded by Severin Hacker and Luis Von Ahn. Um, we use adaptive learning to personalize the learning experience for all of um, our language learners. And so what that means is that we are um, tracking an individual's strengths and weaknesses and making sure um, that they are uh, constantly uh, relearning what they, we know that they do not know yet. Um, simultaneously, as you're going through the learning experience, you can report errors. So let's say you get a question and you translate it incorrectly, but you know that that should be accepted. Well, it's very easy to report that error, and it goes into our system, and what you're doing is you are um, essentially making the experience better for a future learner, if that is accepted. And what we do is we, um, we surface the ones in our system that have the most reports, um, because chances are it's, it's, it's accurate. Um, we believe that everyone should have access to education of the highest quality for free. And we approach all of our product development through this lens. Um, this is our team. Um, we are three years old, and um, there are 40 of us. And we come from all over the world. Um, and we are all passionate about this mission of more fair access to education and free language learning. Um, we're designers, we're engineers, and we're community builders. OK. Um, so we started with a handful of course offerings, um, which were developed by our language experts. And um, these were people that were in-house, and they sort of paved the way for course creation in the future. Um, these are some of the courses we started with, Spanish for English speakers, um, um, and also English for Spanish speakers, and then a handful more. And now we offer over 60 language courses to our community. There are 85 million people learning a language for free. And w the community is a diverse um, group of people from all over the world. And I just want to play this video, which is um, from TEDx in Guatemala. This is not a fellow team member. Um, and he's going to introduce a young man who learned um, English through Duolingo and also a bunch of other platforms. Um, and so this speaks to the power of technology and um, what you can do when given the opportunity to learn. And I'd like to have you meet him. Jimmy, please welcome me on stage. There we go. Hello. So tell me about yourself, Jimmy. Hi, everybody. My name is Jimmy. I'm 12 years old, and I really like to play video games and read books. So how did you learn English? Uh, I learn English by practicing and reading, listening. I already end the program Duolingo. I practicing in, in videos, Skype, and writing on WhatsApp. So, So he was having a fluent conversation. I speak Spanish. It, the conversation was easier had in English than it was in Spanish, because his conversational English is so good. Um, and tell me, how much English did you know eight months ago? Oh, I learned eight months ago, or March of the last year. And how much did you know eight months ago? Nothing. <laughs> But 
But it's not just Jimmy that's learning a language on Duolingo. It's people from all over the world, from diverse backgrounds and countries and age groups. Um, it's this woman in the um, far right corner who is from Chile. He's, she's learning French on her new tablet. It's this granny um, in Europe who is thrashing her granddaughter at Duolingo on her iPad. And it's people like Bill Gates. So how did we do this? Um, so what we did was we had all of these people, thousands of people who wanted to learn um, languages that we could not offer. So courses like Danish for English speakers or um, English for Mandarin speakers. Simultaneously, we had people who um, came to us, hundreds of people, who wanted to contribute to a course. So they were bilingual. Um, they felt like they had the knowledge necessary and the skills to volunteer, and they were really passionate about our mission. So what we decided to do is open up our platform, and we designed something called the Duolingo Incubator. Um, the Duolingo Incubator launched a year and a half ago, and this was um, something we did to open up our platform so that volunteers could create courses based on all of the knowledge that we had about what made a good language course and all the metrics and data we had around language learning at that point. Um, so what you would do is that is you would, if you were bilingual, you would come to the Duolingo Incubator page and you would apply. You would explain why you were passionate about this mission, um, your experience on Duolingo, and then what you brought to this course. And then from there, the Duolingo staff would look through the applicants. Um, we would find two moderators who would lead the course creation. And we would empower them to find um, the next people that would join their team. Um, this is what a, a community member will see when they are using Duolingo to learn. It's called the language learning tree. And this is a Swedish course. And that's my um, coworker, Vivian, who has a 700 day streak, which is Absolutely insane and awesome. Um, that means she's been using Duolingo every day for 700 days, if you don't know. Um, and so what happens here is you go through uh, basics, and in increasingly, the course gets harder. And as I mentioned before, it's adaptive learning, so we're surfacing your strengths and weaknesses, and um, you're constantly improving. So what we did was we, um, be, uh, for our contributors, they get a template from a course that resembles theirs, um, and they work off that and then start de defining language rules um, based on knowledge that they have, and they get to decide sentences and word structure and the skills even, and they develop a course together. Um, it's almost like putting together a puzzle because you can't actually teach certain words unless you've taught certain gr grammatical terms. So um, that can sometimes be limiting, but it's actually created um, really interesting sentences and made the whole learning process a little bit more fun. So some of you might be familiar with them, but here's just an example from the Danish course. It's um, a duck says good morning, and this was um, probably something that came out of um, that challenge of sort of trying to figure out a sentence that worked with maybe good or morning. Um, so I want to leave you with a framework for developing a volunteer program. And I'm going to use the incubator as an example and sort of share how we went through this process of creating this, um, this program. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is that you must be mission driven. Um, and these are some organizations that are doing amazing work with, um, through the power of their volunteers. OpenStreetMap uh, recently, in the wake of the um, earthquake in Nepal, uh, they took satellite data and made digital maps that made it easier to navigate streets that people just didn't know um, existed. And so this is really powerful stuff when you can get volunteers behind a strong mission. Um, so you need to ask yourself, can your community help? So within that, there are some questions that you might consider. Um, can your mission be furthered? Um, so at Duolingo, we knew that our mission of making language learning accessible to everyone for free was way bigger than the 40 people in the room designing um, this experience. Um, do fe people feel a personal connection? Language learning is inherently a social experience. Everyone has a reason to learn. Um, and so you're kind of tapping into that. 
And then is there a problem that provides value to others when solved? So what is the outcome going to be something that um, is really valuable to other people? And then is your com uh, project community driven, bottom up and not top down? So what that means is um, are volunteers coming to you versus are you going to have to um, pay people to volunteer? Um, and really, that's when you, you don't want a program like this. Um, so in thinking about this framework, there are four steps that you might want to go through. Step one is really important, and it's defining the goals of the program. Step two is opening small parts. Um, step three is tracking progress. And step four is something you're going to do over and over again, and it's learning and iterating. So step one, defining goals. There are challenges within this that you need to consider, and th th these are all challenges that we definitely had to consider with our, when we opened up our platform to volunteers. Um, so people may come to you and be really excited about contributing, but they might not be perfect for a certain volunteer program. So you might want to create different ways for them to contribute. So at Duolingo, um, we have a moderator program in our forums, and if you're not bilingual, um, and equipped to maybe create a course, that might be a great way for you to be a leader in the community. Um, as I said earlier, even if you're taking the course, you're actually contributing to the learning experience by taking the course because we're able to refine the language learning experience based off of that data, and then also um, by reporting. You're improving the experience for others. Um, and then maintaining high quality content. So when people enter your system, and when these courses launch, it's impacting millions of people. Um, and so you want to make sure that you have these checks and balances along the way. Um, you want it to be easy to contribute. You want people to come back and be excited. Um, and then just the inherent difficulty with um, course creation is that languages are um, all varied and have different grammatical requirements. Um, that affect our system. So, and then also just that everyone's coming from all over the world and they all speak different languages. So how do you unify people? Um, and you want it to be really fun. Uh, volunteering should be fun first. Um, and then you need to sort of tap into why people are doing this and what are the incentives um, for volunteers. So um, the first question is, why are you doing this? You might want to just ask yourself that first. And if you can't get past that one, you, you uh, this is, again, something you might not want to do. And then how much are you willing to invest? So do you have one developer and two designers, or do you have a whole team that's going to be able to build this um, experience for you? And then timeline. Um, and then how are you going to evaluate a successful program? Um, what makes a success? And who are your volunteer leaders? You probably know a handful of them already. Um, and these are going to be the people that are going to help you build a successful program. And then lastly, what are the community guidelines and norms that you're going to make um, that will set the volunteers up for success? And you want to leave some leeway in this um, decision making so that you can empower your volunteers to define this community for themselves. Um, so at Duolingo, the, uh, the mission of the incubator is contribute to a course and change the world. Um, if you go to incubator.duolingo.com, you'll land on this page. Um, and this is something that all volunteers will see. Um, the goal of the incubator is to build free language courses. The goal of the course uh, volunteers is to build the course's curriculum. And the goal of the community team is to support contributors through the experience and work with the development team to create the best community-driven experience possible. And it can often look like this photo I took in uh, Mexico City, where you have all these different balloons kind of tied together neatly, and you're creating the framework as the community team that will sort of lead everyone um, to a successful place. Step two is starting small. And um, this is an important one, because you don't want to go necessarily from 0 to 100 all at the same time. Um, so how did we get started? Well, we launched select languages. So we didn't launch all the languages that the community wanted. We were very particular about where starting small in this regard. Um, we embraced high-touch interactions, and we didn't automate everything that we knew we could automate eventually um, because we wanted to move fast. And then we found those volunteer leaders and empowered those contributors 
to move forward and um, help create this amazing community that's the incubator. And this is an image that um, represents a milestone for us. The first course that launched out of the incubator was English for Russian speakers. Um, and this is kind of when we knew that this project might be bigger than what we could have ever imagined. So in starting small, you want to build the right tools as you grow. Um, we can all imagine all those great features and tools that would make everyone's life easier. But again, you need to prioritize. So at Duolingo, we created something called the Workshop, which um, is a course creators and volunteers toolbox. And we're always adding to it so they can bulk edit sentences and do things um, that make it easier to create their course. Step three is tracking progress. So um, the incubator it has three phases, and we have metrics that you need to hit in order to graduate into the next phase. Um, phase one, you are translating all the sentences based off of a tree. And um, this is the graph that you might see as a volunteer. It compares your team to the incubator average, which is um, all the teams together, and that's in green. So this is a benchmark for you, and you can kind of gauge um, where you are. And then phase two is when your course has graduated into beta, and you now have real uh, learners or people using your course who are giving feedback. Um, and this is thousands and thousands of people who've been waiting desperately to learn Turkish for English speakers, for example. Um, and what you're doing there is all of those error reports that are coming in, you're trying to um, get the number down. And in order to graduate from beta and release the course to, on all platforms, you need to get um, three reports per 100 users for at least two, uh, two weeks. So they're all um, really strategizing around how to do that. And this is, this is a, a difficult phase. But it's also an exciting phase because you're inviting people to join the community. At this stage, your forum launches. And um, you get to define what your language learning community is going to be. Um, the Dutch team is very well known for their humor and for their engagement of uh, Dutch learners. And for April Fools, um, because they're also known for having the word duck in their sentence, the, they um, rebranded their entire Facebook page um, and called it, it went from du Duolingo Dutch learners to Duolingo duck learners, which was absolutely hysterical for people who are incredibly obsessed with this course and the community around it. So, um, and phase three is your course is launched and you're just, you're looking at those reports and constantly improving based on this feedback that's still coming in. Um, and step four is learning and iterating um, and repeating that constantly. Um, so at Duolingo, we were getting all this qualitative feedback on multiple channels, and um, it was all coming from all directions, and we really wanted to make, turn it into quantitative feedback for our development team. So we launched a user voice board that allocated votes for the community members volunteering, and they could share feature requests and also bug reports, and then we could be transparent and say, we're working on this now or we're not, and um, it really engaged the community in a, uh, transparent way and has, has helped us with our communication. So you're probably asking why are people doing this? Um, so a lot of people talk about the power of swag um, and how t-shirts are awesome and they are awesome. No, everyone loves to get a package um, with branded t-shirts but really when you're thinking about incentives for volunteers it goes way beyond that. Um, it goes into understanding why people are contributing. And um, I recently met this guy in San Francisco in the airport who um, was dressed really nicely, and he was directing people to the best transportation to get into the city. Um, and he had a badge on him that said, don't yell at me, I'm a volunteer. And I immediately went up to him and I was like, I need to understand why you're doing this. Why are you volunteering? And he said, well, I would be bored otherwise. I'm retired. I love this. And so what that speaks to is this sense of belonging that is so powerful that it motivates people to volunteer. And we see this t over and over again with all of the volunteers in the incubator community. So what are five traits of a great volunteer? They believe in the mission. They're enthusiastic. They're flexible because tons of things are going to go wrong. Um, and they're committed and communicative. 
And who are these amazing people who've been contributing to the incubator project? They come from all over the world. They're from Syria, Germany, United States, Brazil, Vietnam, and they're, they have amazing um, talents. They're scientists working on the immune system and cancer. They're big data consultants, PhDs in the sociology of the internet. And we're creating community also through chat systems where people can, um, on the incubator, share course guidelines and also share um, life updates like birthdays and amazing milestones that may be more personal. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did the Incubator Summit, um, which brought together volunteers from around the world for a day of learning. Um, and what was so incredible was I time and time again met teams of volunteers who I swore had known each other for years. And really, when I asked them, they said they'd never met before, but we've spent every night together chatting on the incubator and building this course together. Um, and it was really inspirational to see that. Um, one of the volunteers even traveled to the incubator summit on his birthday, and this is a card we made um, thanking him for celebrating with us because we thought that was pretty awesome. Um, at Duolingo, we are constantly thinking of authentic ways to thank our volunteers. We know that a lot of our success is due to all the contributions from the community. Um, so we will do uh, Skype calls, uh, video conferences, notes, and just um, try to thank our community as much as possible throughout this journey. So what can we accomplish together? It turns out a lot. In a year and a half, we've created 40 new language courses by, through the power of volunteers. That means millions more people are learning for free around the world. More people on Duolingo are learning Irish than native speakers in the world. And we've done this all through the community. So I want to end where I started. Um, and this is the thought that I want everyone to leave with. Together we can achieve more than when we think and act alone. Thanks. <laughs>